What's up guys, David or one, two, and two, and it's list day. Ah yes, list day. And today we're gonna be looking at the top 10 cool things about Duel Links. Last video we talked about all the things that drove me absolutely insane about the game, so in order to balance out the Cosmere, I need to talk about the cool things too, because without it, we're just being unfair. Like I said last time, I actually really do enjoy the game for what it is and its interesting take on Yu-Gi-Oh, and it does actually have quite a bit to offer. And without further ado, let's kiss some Konami butt. The number 10 coolest thing about Duel Links is the soundtrack. The soundtrack in this game actually slaps. The funniest thing about that though is I spend most of the time with the sound off because like I'm playing on the toilet or something and I don't want to have that every time I turn the stupid thing on so I normally have the volume off. But that doesn't mean like I can't appreciate it during like things like my live stream when I actually have it on. Overall, it's just a really, really fun soundtrack. Number nine are those ultra and super rare tickets I mentioned last time. Yes, it would be cool if we had the normal and rare so that we can get some harder to acquire box normals and rares, but that gripe aside, we need to also acknowledge that we can get box supers and ultras. No, no, he's got a point. Almost annoying as digging through a box looking for one rare when the rest of the box is a bunch of crap you don't want. Try looking for one ultra rare when the rest of the box is crap you don't want. Oof. So the fact that we get these things a couple times a year is really, really nice because it allow you to get maybe the one-off tech card that you needed from a box that you didn't really like other than the tech card or to let you finish off a play set of a card that you absolutely need. You just didn't feel like going through a box for a third time to get. Because let's be real, when you need like a three of ultra rare in your deck, that is, that really stinks. Number eight's for all you weebs out there. You get to play as your favorite anime character. There is nothing quite like taking on the persona of one of your favorite characters from one of them Chinese cartoons. F***ing idiot. I remember back when I first started playing the game, there was something kind of cathartic about summoning the Dark Magician and having Yugi say it and then declare dark magic attack when you declare an attack. That is, there was something fun about that, I must admit. Again, most of the time I play with the sound off, but uh, you know what? It is pretty cool they had all the voice actors come back to reprise the roles and declare summoning conditions they, they they had never actually done in the show. Gotta cover all your bases, baby. But aside like all the fan service that each character kind of inherently comes with, it is just kind of cool that like they get unlock cards and have skills and things that cater to their deck in the show. So whether or not you want to play as like a, a role play anime character deck or you just want to play a specific deck that requires a certain skill, it is kind of cool that you can like play bones with your zombies or my with your harpies. There's whether you're a weeb or not, there's something kind of nice and, and um, organized about that. I don't know. It's, 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 it's nice and neat. Not only that, but it does telegraph what your opponent's playing before they even play a card. That's a dynamic we don't have in the TCG. So that alone is actually kind of interesting. Number seven is the booster box system in the game itself. Why would you say something so controversial yet so brave? I know that's gonna sound pretty weird for people that are like, man, I had to get three boxes just to get my Deneb's to play AS Knights and that's a pain in the butt. And I, I would agree. However, you know you need to get three boxes. I think that's pretty novel. In the TCG, you can buy a million boxes and not pull a play set of the card that you want, potentially speaking. But in Duel Links, you know exactly what cards are in each box and how many are left. And you can even filter it by which ones you already have. So like, the booster box system is really taking advantage of the fact that it is not real and just a digital format. It even allows you to reset the box anytime you want. So if you pulled the ultra rare and the two supers that you wanted uh, and you don't really want the rest of the crap in the box, you can reset anytime you want to get a shot at getting the next couple copies of those. So like, it, it's pretty, it's pretty generous all considering. This thing could have been a hell of a lot more burdensome on the player, but I, I think they got this, I think they got it pretty good. Number six is the Casey Cup. Yes, I know the Karma Cut Cup can be a little grating sometimes, and uh, sometimes the player base isn't exactly the most diverse format you've ever played in. <laughs> However, with really no official in-person events going on with the TCG, it is nice that we've been getting a regular set of 
officially supported competitive events, like the KC Cup. They happen all the time, and you know what, frankly, the prizes are pretty good. If you just grind for a couple hours in the KC Cup, you can get an ass load of gems, and really that's all we care about, right? They really do reward the players for just participating in PvP events in general, so it is really kind of nice that we have options to do this as opposed to just regular ladder grinding. Number five is that decks are often pretty cheap. The structure deck system in this game, uh, as odd as it sounds to have a structure deck in a digital format, they're pretty reasonably priced, uh, gem or real money wise, and they have a pretty decent track record of containing cards that are either for good decks or they are good decks themselves. You buy three of them like you would in the TCG and you have a pretty solid deck. Uh, for instance, Gaia recently, that's a pretty solid deck with just three of those things. Three. Unless you're gonna go hard, no exceptions, free to play, really pretty reasonable. Number four, the battle traps. Battle traps are quintessential classic Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> There's nothing quite like declaring an attack and your opponent saying, you have activated my trap card. Even though you, your opponent doesn't activate your trap cards, you activate your own trap cards. And nothing feels more like that than the battle trap. The battle trap is the most Yu-Gi-Oh of all traps. Mirror force, magical cylinder. Big battle traps are actually good in Duel Links. And why is that? Well, it's, it's kind of twofold. We don't have a ton of spot removal in our extra decks yet. So uh, battle traps can probably last till the battle phase a lot easier than they can in the TCG. And also the battle phase just in general is more important to Duel Links because there's no main phase two. Things that happen in the battle phase stay in the battle phase, and that's just how the turn ends. I think it's cool that Wall of Disruption is good in Duel Links as a battle trap because it, it's kind of a do-nothing card. But because we don't have a main phase two, and because the battle phase is so important because of it, things like a, a do-nothing card like Wall of Disruption actually becomes a pretty solid card for a neg one. Because I can't have a main phase two, and I can't do anything with all those monsters you just zeroed out. So they're just stuck like that in attack mode, waiting to get trampled over on the next turn. That small, simple change of just not having a main phase two makes an entire genre of trap card a lot more impactful. And frankly, it's, it's pretty cool. Number three is the card pool. Now that sounds that that's kind of a subjective thing. Maybe your favorite card in the game is 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 not in 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 Duel Links yet. However, you got to admit that the card pool is pretty interesting. I think because hindsight's 2020, Konami can pretty much curate every single one of these sets with cards that have proven track records in the actual game to know kind of vaguely how they're going to impact the game, whether they should release them or not. And because they've been withholding certain cards and, and promoting others, we have a very diverse and different type of card pool than we do in the real game. Some of this is due to the fact that, like I said before, we don't have a main phase two and that makes weird cards better. But Konami does have some idea like, I'm never gonna put Helk in this game because Helka Fibrax is freaking broken so that this game will just never have to worry about it kind of stuff. And that's been pretty much true since the first set of the game. Every single set is some mix of new cards and old cards specifically curated in order to tease the meta in the direction that the company feels that they should go as opposed to just, you know, releasing product because they got to and then the player base coming up with some sort of weird FTK that they never even thought of and ruining the format like we tend to do. <laughs> They can be a lot more careful with their card releases, and I think it creates a more diverse and interesting format. Number two. It's kind of an extension on number three, but decks that are bad in the TCG tend to do well in Duel Links. Things like Vampires and Fur Hires never really did very much in the TCG, despite the fact they're kind of cool decks, but they did get a chance to shine in Duel Links because, like I said before, the curated card pool and lack of a main phase two and skills and other just general tweaks to the game that make it different than the TCG allowed these different decks to shine. It's cool that For Hire got to be a tier one deck in something because it's a fun deck. It, it's a shame that it just couldn't be as good in the TCG. So it's cool that players who like that deck could, you know, enjoy some sort of uh, meta success in a different format. I think that's cool. It also leads to interesting discussions whenever we get like a TCG exclusive like War Rocks or something where its use in the actual TCG sounds kind of dubious. 
But we can't have a real discussion about if it was to be imported in the Duel Links, how would that do? Because it's a different format and it adds for a different and interesting perspective on cards that we would normally just kind of brush to the side. We do have an honorable mention, and that honorable mention is Tour Guide of the Underworld. Sure, we don't get to have her as a card, but we get her as a character, and she's waifu. Wow! I think that's just fun. It's like, it's like they know that she's a popular card with the player base. So uh, they decided to make Dante's side piece an actual character in the game. I think that's fun. I like the bingo charts. We also have a dishonorable mention. It's them booed players again. Oh! I got you guys again. Screw you, you stupid jerks. Every single stream, you're just free wins. So I don't understand why the hell I actually hate you guys so much other than the fact that it's just gotten tedious to play. So much so I beat on you two videos in a row. And I maintain that none of you guys know how to play the deck or even build it. Here, watch this. Is that fucking Hain Hain? It was. I mean, that's, that's that, man that is true. Hain -hain? Yeah, that was a real one that I played. Today's sponsor is MetaMats. If you guys want a custom cloth playmat, use my link in the description below. And make sure to use my promo code TROLLTHEMAT at checkout to get 10% off your order and get one of those nifty custom cloth playmats that I pretty much only exclusively use now. And the number one coolest thing about Duel Links is the ban list. Okay, so that sounds like a weird thing to think is cool because the ban list is really only there to solve problems, right? But nah, we as players, we love the ban list. Every time the TCG releases one, everyone releases videos for making that stupid face. But nah, we love that ban list. We love that stupid thing. But that's not what we're talking about here. Now, what I'm talking about here is the way the Duel Links ban list works. In the TCG, Things are either banned, limited, semi-limited, or just not. If it's banned, you can't use any of them. If it's limited, you can run one copy of that in your deck. But you can run as many limited cards as you want, as long as you're not running more than one copy of any one of them. Same thing with the semi-limited, you can have up to two copies of it, and you can run as many of those as you want, as long as any one of those two copies doesn't become a third. But in Duel Links, they've changed that up. If you have a limited card in your deck, a card at one, you can only also have that many in your deck. Just like if you have a semi-limited card, like that's at two, you can only have two of those in it. But they don't have to be the same card. You're just limited to two semi-limited cards in your deck. They don't need to be the same. You could have one enemy controller and one treacherous trap hole, or two enemy controller or two treacherous trap hole. I just think that's really cool because what it does is it means that if you get a really, really troublesome deck with a card that's really, really broken in that deck and you limit that card, if the player base still wants to use that deck, they now can no longer put broken staples in their broken deck because their one-off limited slot is now being being utilized as an in-archetype slot, and they can't use it for a one-off power card. Meaning, if you're playing a bad deck and it doesn't have anything on the ban list in any fashion, you can pump it full of power cards the good players don't have access to. It inherently balances the game in a really interesting way, and I really wish we could use it in the TCG, but obviously the, the problem with that is it causes a logistical nightmare. We would just have to basically say, stop playing Yu-Gi-Oh for five months while we figure this out. I just think the inherent balancing mechanic of the Duel Links ban list is actually neat. Also, it's a digital format, and uh, the thing badgers you with notifications when you turn the game on, so they can pretty much just fix anything anytime they want, and then just splash you with it as soon as you open the game. It's much more streamlined, and I like what it does with the format. I think it's cool. Anyway, guys, that was the list. I hope you enjoyed it. Duel Links is turning out to be a pretty fun thing, and it's honestly been a, a godsend considering um, the state real Yu-Gi-Oh's in. At least we can play something competitively that doesn't require a bunch of webcams. So let me know down in the comments what you guys think, and remember guys, if you don't troll the meta who will, I'll see you guys next time. Just a quick special thank you to all my supporters over on Patreon. You guys make the whole channel possible. You guys have no idea how much it means to me that you guys do that. If you guys want to be part of the Goblet Attack Force, link for the Patreon down in the description below. No time left in the video, I summon Dark Magician, declare direct attack. Subscribe for vids. Told you I was the master.